Hi, and welcome to the Flute Talk Podcast, where we talk about all things flute, live here on Patreon. What is Patreon? Patreon is a place for fans like you to come and support creators like us. So why not join us over on Patreon and help us continue to make great content? The Flute Talk Podcast is also brought to you by the Flute Center of New York. The Flute Center of New York has the world's largest selection of flutes. If you need to buy a flute or piccolo, the Flute Center of New York has you covered. With our code TFC at checkout, you can try up to three to four flutes for up to 10 days, have an extended 18-month warranty, and free shipping worldwide. So be sure to go to the website flutes4sale.com. So that's flutes the number four, sale.com, flutesforsale.com. Just be sure to use that code TFC for all those perks. And a little bit of that does go our way. Another sponsor as well, ourselves. We have a store. If you haven't noticed yet, we have a store over at store.theflutechannel.com. We have some shirts and posters and things like that over at Teespring. So you can definitely go there and get some merch posters whatever you'd like that we have it will be there you probably notice it under our videos if you're interested be sure to go to store.theflutechannel.com that helps us out immensely so yeah on with the show hey everybody welcome to the flute talk podcast i'm nick and i'm emily how's it going emily very good how are you i'm good i'm good so today we're going to be talking about back to school flute piccolo tips or flute tips you know what i mean uh, also, I just want to do another additional uh, little ad for Tom Play. Tom Play is doing their back to school sale for their annual subscription. So if you go into the description right now uh, or later after the video, uh, there's a link there for 30% off the subscri- annual subscription. And we've been using Tom Play a lot, especially during these times during uh, COVID and stuff. Uh, it really helps with the rehearsing and playing different types of stuff. And the backtracks are cool. And Oh, yeah. It's yeah, they're pretty cool. Very good quality backtracks yeah. and can change the speed. You can do make loops to practice. Yeah. And even if you play with an accompanist, very mm-hmm. often you have one or two rehearsals with the pianist. That's true. So it's good to play before and know the other part. Cause exactly. We practice, sometimes we practice our part as if it was the only part, but the composer wrote the whole work. The whole work is the real music not just the flute part exactly and in addition to that they also have another link in the description for a fingering chart which is actually quite interesting they have a free fingering chart there that you can refer to digitally if you want so you can go there as well so they're really pushing on that so as you well. can so click on a note and it's going to show you the fingering? i believe so but you have to check the it's it's a bit of a little bit of everything but it's a digital format so if you're really stuck on finding fingerings this might be your one link that you want to go to all the time and i think that one's free so you got that as a free link and then you okay, have okay. the other link for the uh, discount on the uh, subscription and full transparency we do get a commission off of that so that helps us tremendously so you know if you have it for a year it's cool there's sheet music collections growing every week they add a new thing for all instruments and plus what's really cool is you have access to all the instruments with an annual subscription so you can go and check a piano and then transcribe there, play play over the piano part or find a violin version of something and play that, you know. So it's yeah, really versatile in that, that way. Sometimes of course. we took violin parts yeah. because we liked uh, exactly. the way it sounded. But they've also transcribed uh, for flute, let's say, the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, but for flute, also all the uh, uh, Four Seasons are also uh, transcribed with an orchestra, all with orchestral parts, so you can play, you know, solo with a real with orchestra, a real orchestra not, yeah. not with a piano uh, no MIDI reduction, sound. Yeah, no, yeah, it's orchestra. really done quite well. So, yeah, be sure to check that out after. Uh, in the description, the links are all there, and that's really it. But that also goes down to our topic today, which is like back to school, you know, with school, or say you go back to work, or say you're, you know, a lot of things are transitioning for a lot of different people sometimes. And uh, how do you incorporate, you know, getting keeping your practicing to a certain level how do you kind of integrate that with with work or with school work and stuff like that what would be some of the tips that you would kind of tell people you know well there's different approaches and right. the, depending also on your goals but like um if uh, you're an adult and you want to play for fun you don't necessarily want to improve like some people just want to don't don't necessarily want to improve anymore just want to play then uh, it's fine. You know, you can just go at your own pace. It's okay. But if you have goals, I feel that putting it in your schedule is easier. It doesn't even have, like, you can have an everyday thing that you do 
um, I don't know, every day after work or after school, you do that at 5 p.m. to 5.30 or 5 to 6 or something like that. But um, I feel, because sometimes with students, what I've done is I looked at their schedule with them mm -hmm. and see, like, how many times a week do you want to practice? Let's say four times is something realistic for you. And this day you have basketball practice. Right. And this day, so we would just pick times that was not necessarily the same every day. Mm -hmm. And you can make a little... Now with phones, it's pretty cool because you can put it in there. But you mm -hmm. can also just make a little schedule of the things that you really want to do. And you pick those times and you put it on a sheet on your fridge or whatever. That can be a good way to um, organize yourself. Yeah, totally. But some people say every day at the same time is easier. I would say take at least a day off during yeah, the week. Yeah. yeah, there's seven days in the week. Try to take, you know, like... It's, you know, take a day off or take uh, two days off. You can practice five days a week. It's totally okay. The brain needs the rest. Some people do a little bit. Um, like I used to practice so much that I couldn't do it all at once. So yeah. I would do a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the evening. Right. You know, some people are yeah. more morning people. So maybe that's exactly. the first thing you do in the morning. Then you're happy or satisfied. I did that. Yeah. That was important for me. Yeah. Another thing would just be just don't get overwhelmed, you know, like do what you can you know like a lot of people they're like oh i have to do something else now and that's taking time away from my practice and then that develops anxiety or develops things like that just you know breathe and figure it out and you know do what you can don't uh, over over uh, work yourself you know just yeah if it's just one element of the day what it's say if it's only 15 minutes and you used to do an hour that 15 minutes is going to be the best 15 minutes you can you can do and then you do all your other stuff you know sometimes it also helps the, like you said helps the brain to uh, detach from that so that it can do its, you know, uh, memory building inside the brain, all those things post, because there's lots of things happening after you practice that helps your practicing. Yeah. And like, I agree with you, guilt is not a productive emotion. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah, think yeah, it helps sure. you to get better at anything. So like sometimes I have students who come to their lesson and, oh, they feel so guilty because they didn't practice enough. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. just leave that behind that's right. the past you can't go back and practice so no. if you you're so stressed the whole time and you think i didn't practice mm -hmm. and if i didn't practice you're not available to learn right so i just say if you want we can look at your schedule together i can help you to mm -hmm. figure out times that suit you right. and make goals with you but exactly like there's no point in feeling guilty for that we oh, all no. do our best yeah. like and maybe you were tired and you didn't you needed to rest yeah. but yeah I feel, and you're right, like sometimes it's 15 minutes with your flute, but then a lot of time thinking about it or like yeah. sometimes we don't, let's say you're watching a video about how to play mm -hmm. some, how to play in the high register. Mm -hmm. Does that count towards practice time? Yeah. I think it does yeah, sure, sure. because if you're practicing the wrong way and you're, or you're always practicing the same way, never getting better. Yeah. Are you being productive? You know, like. Exactly. Or the other day, I w you were listening to a Something, piece that yeah. you want to learn. Yeah, yeah. You were doing other stuff. Oh, yeah. I was but washing dishes, kind of doing whatever. You're washing dishes mm -hmm. and practicing yeah, in a way totally. because you're learning the melody. Yeah, because you already know that you already have all the tools to be a musician. You don't need the instrument there with you all the time. You can just propagate all the, t all the skills into your brain and your brain yeah. will do some work it's not going to do everything but it can do a lot or like let's say you're doing ear training or theory is it practicing it's not flute practice but yeah it's still quite important to understand exactly. music if you want to be a musician so totally like uh it's a whole thing and yeah i feel sometimes stopping and saying like you said if you just have 15 minutes mm -hmm. what's your most yeah. important goal maybe yeah. if you have less time uh, some days you can skip some parts mm -hmm. maybe you can skip do a quicker warm-up skip some parts if you have a sure. piece to learn you go directly mm -hmm. to that you know yeah. yeah and like i said especially right now there can be that feeling of a mad rush because you're trying to organize things school starting there's a lot of people all those things just you know maybe just focus on your school stuff for the first two weeks and then try to integrate you know uh, music into that or you're practicing into that if you feel truly overwhelmed reduce you know take away things and then put it back in because in reality no one's going to notice that you didn't practice for two weeks. No one's going to do that because you're just going to get back into the swing of things. Yeah. And also, I feel sometimes procrastination, it's been shown that it's um, when we procrastinate, it's because we kind of feel not we can we feel real pain when we think about the thing we have to do. Right. And so we avoid 
so that we don't have to feel the pain, so we procrastinate. That's why we do right. that. Mm -hmm. But it's shown that once you start the task that you were procrastinating, uh, the pain goes away. Yeah. So it's counterproductive to procrastinate. So exactly. that's why I think making a schedule is so good. Totally. Or lists. I like lists mm -hmm. as well. Sometimes I Some people make a journal list. as well. Some I want to practice these stuff. things yeah. tomorrow or I want to make sure I practice flute tomorrow oh, that yeah. much time. I want to do at least an hour of flute tomorrow. Yeah. Then sometimes I prefer lists, but yeah. some people prefer like making a real yeah. schedule. I'm going to do it at this time because this way they're... Yeah. I knew somebody... Set. Yeah. I knew somebody back in the day, they had a stopwatch. So they would just press the... They, would, they needed to do an hour, but they didn't have an hour of time concurrently all together at once so he would hit it it would go to 15 or 20 because that's the only time he had to stop it then he would go do his things that he was supposed to do then go back do the other one until add it up to the time he wanted because he realized there were spots all throughout the day but it was an old school like watch you can do that now with your phone uh -huh, like yeah. you know you just put a stopwatch and let it run and then when you're at whatever time you have available stop it so that way you know you have the secondary or third uh, way of kind of visualizing and putting things together and making you then feel like you actually did something i like that because maybe you don't realize that you have 10 minutes here yeah. 15 minutes there yeah. in your day yeah and that's also yeah that's very good yeah because like smaller chunks of practice yeah. can be good because oh, yeah. you're totally. very focused when yeah. i was a teenager my school bus would get to the school 30 minutes before the start of class so i would okay. do 30 minutes every morning mm -hmm. that was like part of my day and i started my day well right and i knew that i had at least that 30 minutes and i had a lot of set times like that i mm -hmm. liked it when i was a, mm -hmm. even when i just started piano when i was young i remember i was like Right. Every day from 4 to 4.45, I practice. My friends would call. I was like, mm -hmm. I'm going to call you back. I have to finish my practice. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, sometimes it's a good way to, to work, to totally. have a set time. Yeah. It can become a habit, a bit like brushing your teeth. Totally. Or you make it a habit. Yeah. Or if you procrastinate a lot, you can use the Pomodoro technique. Yeah. Which is like, Pomodoro. let's say you say, yeah. I practice 30 minutes and then I get, I do that little thing that I like. I watch like a... Mm -hmm. episode of that show that i like after sure. or i eat uh some chocolate mm -hmm. or i don't know <laughs> you know like you get a little yeah, yeah you you do that thing that maybe you tend to procrastinate on mm -hmm. and then you get the little you give yourself a little something totally so you, you put a 30 minutes maybe, exactly and then you get something another mm -hmm. 30 minutes you get something you yeah know? Oh, thanks, uh, by the way, to Kent Arimura, who's all the way in Saudi Arabia. That's amazing. And also, Adios Ascension. Thanks for the $100. That's amazing as well, too. Both of you. Thank and you And everybody so else much. who's contributed with Super Chat. Those help us directly. If you're listening on the podcast during the live show, we have the opportunity to have our fans uh, donate to us directly through Super Chat on YouTube. So if you're listening to this uh, after and uh, you want to come and participate during the live shows, come during the live shows. And if you want to help us out that way, that helps us out a lot as well. But yeah, just to kind of follow back to the practicing thing in the short intervals they uh, even in um in exercising people nowadays they're encouraging more short intervals throughout the day if you can do it so like say like even for like the plank like say the plank i've been researching about the plank so if you do one minute every uh if you do one minute four times a day it's way more than just do it's way more uh, cardiovascular and better brain health better everything health than doing four minutes in a row. In a row, all together at once, which is even harder. But in reality, they've they've done an analysis about the returns on that. And the returns are actually lower than saying somebody who can do one minute four times throughout the day. So if you can do practicing and that's all you can do, don't think it's like, oh, I'm only doing 15 minutes four times. It's or, not going to oh, be anything. Oh, it's not worth it. I only have 15 minutes. No, it's totally it's worth totally it. It's totally worth it. It's always like, worth it for you. Let's say you do... Five days a week, you have yeah. only 15 minutes before you go yeah. to work or before you go to school. Right. And you're like, oh, no, 15 minutes is not enough. But just in a week, 15 yeah. minutes, five yeah. times, it's an hour and 15 minutes. Exactly. And then if you do that in a month, yeah. it's yeah. five hours. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah, something yeah. like that. And that's like concentrated practice. So if you look at that, it can really, um, if you look at it that way, it really can help your practice a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is also a podcast where you guys can also ask us questions in the live chat. So be don't be a stranger and say where you're from, and also uh, a question if you have one. Oh, and also what else? Sometimes having a practice buddy. 
Yeah, practice buddy or somebody who who holds you accountable. Like, yeah, the same thing goes down to workouts again. Like, I know friends that have workout buddies who call them in the morning. Like, oh, did you do that? Oh, yeah, did you do this? Did you do the 15 push-ups? Oh, yeah, I did it. Did you do 20? Yeah, I did that. You know, like, people do that or yeah. email each other or text each other. Yeah, did you do your, yeah. your warm-up? Have a musician friend that... Yeah, who can listen to you also play and stuff. I know there's a lot of, like, that in discords and stuff. Like, a lot of people pr- practice in front of each other in discords and stuff. And that's really cool, too, because you get feedback and everyone's also practicing and separate rooms literally like digital rooms so you, you can hear somebody else practice yeah you see how they're doing the it yeah that's kind of cool it's pretty i cool. used to practice with a friend sometimes like we would do our warm-up in the morning together like oh, yeah. do our sound exercises right. scales and stuff together and then the rest of our stuff was different so we would split but it was fun instead of always being alone in your practice uh cubicle you know <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. exactly so we also, well, we're just going to go back to some questions now. Um, Andre, he uh, wants to know, I'm originally a sax player uh, that was messing around with flute this summer for fun. I haven't put enough time into it to be as good as I want. Any tips for improving tone for a beginner? Um, yes, I guess. Well, um, yeah, so if you're a saxophone player, you know probably about support. Yeah. But it's a bit different, I think, for the flute. Because yeah. when you play the sax... You have an embouchure in your mouth you and you have resistance yeah. there. So it forces you to push, you yeah. know, when you have the flute, there's no resistance, right. no embouchure resistance. It's like yeah. singing. Yeah, you just, yeah. So you have to make sure you're yeah. supporting Yeah. and you have to make sure you don't tense up the lips yeah. instead of supporting with the air because right. the lips have to be stable <laughs> totally, totally. Mm-hmm. and stable, not too relaxed, like not, but like, uh, but not tense either. Just neutral, you know, stable. And then the um, the tension is in the muscles involved in blowing the air and supporting the air. Right. Yeah, because there's a it's like a bottleneck and like that's it's like a bottleneck the resistance there. So you have to really you can't do anything about it. You got to work for that. So like with flute, you don't have that bottleneck. So you have to kind of just like remind yourself like oh. I'm just letting out all the air as much as I can, but you have to, like you said, focus it to make that, make that mouthpiece that isn't there anymore. So you can develop that faux resistance. Yeah. You know? You're kind of making it with yeah. your lips. Yeah. And then it has to stay. Choose your best note. Oh, I, that's check a, yourself in the mirror. What a good idea. On your best note. That's probably your best embouchure. And keep it throughout the registers. Right. If you have to move too much, it means you're not using air speed. Totally. So in the low register, use slower air. So mm-hmm. warm air. You can try in your hand mm-hmm. to blow warm air. And the high register, it's cold air, faster air. Right. And, you know, there's a slight, slight movement of the lower lip or it's the slightly jaw. and it's almost involuntary in a way. Yeah. I don't yeah, even it's think almost, about it's it. Involuntary. It's involuntary. Yeah. And I go a bit back in the lower register and a bit forward yeah. in the... When I high register of, yeah. but it's not where i put my energy mm-hmm. my attention goes to airspeed right and um keeping this stable it's mm-hmm. like you have a mask and you put your mask and then you blow yeah and people put so much effort and attention oh, in the lips less is more and the lips are not doing much my upper lip doesn't even move mm-hmm ever mm-hmm. i just leave it there yeah and i know there's a lot of lingo out there with like lip attitude and all those things but that's for something completely different this is lip just a, yeah with the whole like you know like making a frown and making a smile and making the lips flexible that's interesting and it's fine but like it's so much stuff you need to you can learn later because right away when you're first starting out you got to really just think and like you said it's involuntary so don't think about those things and just think about the breathing and think about you know the blowing and stuff first and then think about those other things later because a lot of people they get so much information online and then they try to add all those things at the beginning and make then they sure get also that you don't push your upper lip forward that you keep uh-huh. keep your upper lip close to the teeth yeah like just natural you know yeah. <laughs> you keep it natural exactly no smile no tension if something you're better to frown like not frown but bring the lips low, low. than to mm. smile you know you so we have a lot of videos about like how to get rid of the air in your sound, right. how to improve your embouchure, all those totally. things. So you can check them out. But that would be my... It's probably simpler than you think. Most people overcomplicate right. the embouchure. It's really about the air. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Open the throat, push air. 
Yeah. And it, like, don't push it all at once. Yeah. Make sure it's controlled airspeed. Yeah, and Andre, please try those things out and then, you know, me- uh, t- uh, leave a comment about how it's been going, let's say, after a week. You yeah, know, seeing and if see it helps. It works. And then maybe we can talk about it again in the next podcast or even make a video about it again because we've made a couple videos about it. But there's always little extra things we should add that we should always yeah, or you know, make add to because everyone's different. It's yeah. always good to have refresh of those things. Sometimes oh, yeah. I read uh, totally. stuff I know I already know about, but it's just oh yeah, I have to remember to totally. tell that to my students. Exactly. Or, you know. Yeah. Um, ooh, oh, and also Ken says thank you for the no uh, video about how to stop a note. Yeah, that's actually been a pretty good video. A lot of people have been liking that. That's uh, one of our latest tutorial videos that uh, on how to uh, yeah yeah the, how exactly. to stop a note. Such it's a one great. Of it happens so like it happens so much with students and never really discussed. I've never seen a video about it. Nothing like that. Like, it's uh, great that we did that because uh, it happens a lot. <laughs> well, it's thanks to my students because yeah. sometimes I teach and then I write a note. Oh, yeah, I should explain that because yeah. it seems obvious to us because we've been playing for together maybe 50 years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if we put our two. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, most exactly. of my life I've been playing the flute. So it's obvious for me. But right, exactly. It's not obvious yeah. for many people. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I was like. Oh, let's do that. Exactly. A lot of great people in the chat, by the way. Uh, the flute girl wants to know a uh, random question, but I'm curious, can you read the tenor clef? Yeah, I think you can. What's the tenor clef? Tenor clef is one of the other clefs. For I know like, the uh, C clef. I know the treble clef. And I like know the, the bass clef. Is that the C clef? Tenor is like the, the clef that the looks that, like... That a, like a K? Yeah, sort of like a oh, K. Oh, in French, we call it the clé de do, like the C clef. I think C it's clef. that one. Yeah, I think it's that. Oh, I'm not very, f- like, uh, I'm okay. Yeah. When I was in university, you know, we had probably yeah. did the same thing. You have to... Um, you read them okay. But you have to analyze right. quartets, and there's always a C-clef in there. I think it's that, yeah. So I wasn't too bad because I was doing a lot of analysis. Right. Now I haven't read it in a while. Yeah. I'm not fluid. Yeah, yeah. Well, I remember being in choir, and we would have to read those types of clefs sometimes and yeah. weird stuff like that. I'm, not weird. I'm very not fluid weird. with the bass clef because I play piano. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's true. There you go. Um... Horse Lover wants to know, I'm currently a piccolo player for my marching band and was wondering how to improve my sound on my lower notes and getting that airy sound out. Can you give me some tips to help with that? Uh, yeah, I just have something about the airy tone thing, like especially in marching band. When you're out in a field, no one hears your airiness. They just hear pure tone. It's physics. So you might hear airiness where you are, but that's just you. And if somebody else hears it and says they hear it, they really can't because in a marching band, it's so loud. It's, yeah. And sound just projects and dissipates and then whatever is left over is that pure sign tone or that pure tone going yeah. to your other going to the people's ears so low register is hard though because low register has on a piccolo has a lower uh doesn't pierce as much as the higher notes so you know work on the low side of things i guess you know and really get a nice uh, work with harmonics if you can on the piccolo there are some <laughs> harmonic series in there so you can develop more color maybe play with color instead of more air because maybe make it less make it more hollow sounding or more thick sounding or make it more transparent or make it whatever you know work with tone colors if that makes sense what were you going to say sorry um well pretty much the same thing to begin like mm-hmm. uh the i wouldn't worry too much about the airiness first like i think when i play the piccolo there's a little bit of air in the low register it's kind of part of the sound of the piccolo uh, it's not like the top notes that are really clear. The lower notes are a bit more, yeah, airy or uh, they have a different type of timber. The difficulty I feel with the low register and the piccolo is that the piccolo is very small. I say a lot of obvious things when I teach. The piccolo <laughs> is very small and the hole in which you blow is very, very small too. Right. So you have to make a smaller hole with your lips because mm-hmm. everything's smaller. Mm-hmm. But then you still have to send the air not too fast because it's still kind of low. It's not low in itself because it's a piccolo, but you understand what I mean? So what I would do is like slow tones in the low register. Look at yourself in the mirror. Make sure, you know, you have a small aperture that you don't over cover or over open the embouchure, like the whole of the, the embouchure on the flute or the piccolo should be covered with your lower lip a little bit, like let's say a third to a quarter, not more than that. Then don't bring your upper lip forward because that's going to cover the embouchure again. Then right. you won't have any sound. You want to have a good distance between your upper lip and 
where the air hits on the embouchure plate, like the other side of the hole where it hits, you want a good distance between your upper lip and that. So make sure you do that. Make sure that your piccolo is stable mm -hmm. as well, because sometimes the piccolo tends to rock. Mm -hmm. There are thumb ports, mm -hmm. or put the keys a little bit more on top and bring in the the embouchure a little bit more inwards. Sometimes it helps with students, because mm -hmm. I've had students, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. their piccolo moves, and then they lose their sound, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But I would say it's just the same as flute, but a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. Maybe don't overblow as well, because sometimes people overblow on the piccolo, and then it just goes an right. octave higher. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. hopefully that helps. Uh, we'll answer about maybe two or three more questions. Um, Jim or Jay Cortese wants to know, do you plan on trying any simple eight-keyed flutes on your channel? Yeah, we have. Well, you play Baroque flute, if that's what you mean. And also... That's one-keyed flute, though. One-keyed. Well, what's an eight-keyed flute? I don't know. Maybe that's what they mean, though. Like a Baroque flute? Let us know in the comments. Also, but you play like recorder and you play, uh, you know, a lot of I stuff like that. I play the recorder pretty okay. Yeah. Uh, you but just played on a nice the, little small one recently, which was really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's That's cute. a little piccolo uh, yeah, uh, it's recorder. It's a sopranino, sopranino recorder. recorder. So cute. Yeah, yeah. And, um, well, we have a lot of flutes yeah, that we want learning. to learn Yeah, we have more. Dizzy, we have uh, Bam Bansuri, Shakuhachi. Shakuhachi? Shakuhachi. Yeah. And we have some like Irish flutes yeah. and tin whistles. And a Baroque flute. And a Baroque flute. The yeah. Baroque flute, I don't play it very well, but I have, like, it's beautiful. Yeah, I yeah, like it nice. sometimes, but exactly. maybe I should learn at least one thing and make a video. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll we're going to do a bunch of different series about each one of them and stuff that's going to be really, really cool in the fall. would like, be fun to have amazing. two so we can play together. We have two Bansuris that are the same, and we have two Irish flutes that are the same, plus a yeah. lot of Irish flutes, like small tin whistles are the But, same. like, if we wanted to play Baroque flute. Oh, so yeah, Baroque flute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun. Yeah. But yeah, so let us know what you mean by that. A key is a kind of flute. Oh, he's telling us right now. A key is a kind of flute that came between Baroque and Bohem. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay Baroque and Bohem. Yeah, yeah, like yeah those ones. It shows up in Irish music. And oh, yeah, actually, we've been I've been considering getting one. We're, we've been looking for a good maker. It's true. Like, <laughs> I think about so many different types of flutes. My, I neglected. It's the flute the that was uh, there in Mozart's period. Exactly. And just a bit above, like you said, like there was, like you said before, yeah, before. Yeah, between Baroque and Bohem, exactly. Yeah, it's in Irish music a lot too. Yeah, well, I'm considering. We're considering getting one. We just have to find, yeah, the time and more research towards it. But yeah, that's a really cool instrument because oh, yeah? it's very versatile. It can play a lot of, you know, like you said, that uh, you know the classical era more, yeah, yeah. and also uh, there's a lot of people makers. Is it in wood or it's, I think in, it's in wood? But yeah? there's some that are made in Delrin. There's some made of a different okay. modern ways. Yeah, yeah. But back then it back was then, still made in wood. Wood, I think. Yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure. But it could be, well, yeah. 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 Exactly. I think there was metal components on top, like they had metal key, metal key work. Like the flute has, has had a pretty, pretty big drastic change in the past several hundred years, and plus forking from recorder yeah, and all those other types of keyless instruments you know so there's a whole interesting uh thing mm -hmm. about that but thank you for diving that into us <laughs> but, but uh, like yeah. i thought that um you know some people say that mozart didn't like the flute right and some people say that he didn't because he wrote that he yeah, didn't like his the journals flute and but everything. i've also read in his journals that he did not also he also liked it maybe too. Like he didn't like yeah. that flutist and on that day right. he wrote that like we all say stuff yeah yeah and uh, <laughs> yeah you he know we don't think a hundred percent of yeah. everything we say yeah yeah so uh, but some people say also that that flute at that time was very out of tune and very tough right. to play so yeah, that's yeah. why maybe he didn't like it that much yeah there you go i don't know mm -hmm. i've never tried it but yeah it, we're I gonna get one interested. i'd like to get one for sure uh, Pauline, she wants to know, uh, how many conservatories did you go to? How were the changes? Did you adapt well to the new classes, teachers, and that sort of stuff? Well, um, not conservatories, but you went to, I went to, to university. went to college and college university. university. Um, well, I've been to f <laughs> what? four, maybe. Okay. Four? Well, yeah. Th well, yeah, the those two. Pre oh, yeah, pre university. Also, yeah, pre -university and then too. my bachelor's it's and true. my master's and my education degree. Yes, it's true. My yeah. music education, education degree. degree. Yeah. Uh, so four like yeah. post high school education places that I went to. But how I, you, like, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, I don't know. Like, like you had different flute teachers. So like, how did those transitions between each teacher, for instance? Uh, 
Well, I guess adapt. my pre-university teacher said, oh, you should go and study with that person. Then I okay. did that. Uh -huh. Then I kind of regretted it. Right. Uh, then you went to the next one. Then I went to the next one. I and loved didn't. it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't no. regret it. You loved it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, Speaking with... moving forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I feel like with um, a couple of... When you step back a little bit, you realize that exactly. even the people that... Uh, may not be the best you still learn something even if it's about yourself how to re find who you are or anything like that you know like uh, ab adversity can be a very good um builder right. of resilience totally and of, oh 100 if, if it's if, i believe in that you know mm -hmm. if you know how to approach it if you know how right. to get out of it mm -hmm. as well Because yeah. the point is not to live in adversity your exactly. whole life, but just if it happens by accident, right. um, to try to make the best out of it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and learn from it. Um, maybe some teachers are there to teach us how not to teach later or uh, some attitudes that you don't want to repeat. But I was pretty lucky. I've had a lot of very, very good teachers. I'm still friends with some of them. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, because you know, in the end of it, they're just people and they're trying to help, you know. They should. They should. Most yeah, of sorry. them yeah, yeah, most try of them, to yeah, help. Yeah. Most of them. Um, yeah, there's always a little stress when you get in a new place. You don't know people and you have yeah. to, uh, you know. Exactly. There's a little stress, but yeah. it's also exciting. Totally. And like we, we can see stress in different ways. We can be, oh, I'm so stressed. Or we can be, oh, maybe I'm excited. Right. I'm going to meet yeah. new people. I'm going to have people. new opportunities. Totally. I'm gonna, And that's that. Uh, that makes you grow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Know? Instead of always being in what's comfortable for you, that's right. not how being you in grow. that comfortable box. You know, you want to be just. You want to be more not introverted, but extroverted. You know, you want to kind of be more out and explore and yeah. figure out things. Don't but feel you can like still the, be introverted and totally. put yourself in situations like it's not a yeah. But uh, yeah, because introversion, extroversion is more like a personality type. Totally. But I'm just you're, talking you're right. about like. Um, exploring the world and seeing things as oh it's cool I can uh, yeah because you you meet different teachers with such different uh, experiences they're not all the same yeah and you make different friends yeah. so maybe in that new place that you're going to you're going to meet someone and start a chamber music group with that person or you're gonna you know mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. never know but yeah. you want to have a balance between too much change and not enough change yeah exactly because <laughs> there can be too much as totally, well totally you know? exactly uh what else we have one last question and then uh but before that like i said um be sure to check out tom play their annual uh 30 off subscription of their annual subscription is happening right now until september 13th i believe so the link is in the description go and check that out it's a very worthwhile uh app you can use it on ipad or on your phone or you can also just use the web browser app as well too on your computer or laptop it's a very very good service also there's another link in there for the fingering chart which they are giving out for people to uh, use and it's like an interactive sort of fingering chart and you can use it uh, online and digitally there and what else uh, you also have uh, the book is going to be coming out this month the intermediate 20 lesson book so we're busy working on that right now we're recording the video and all those things this weekend. so that's going to come out soon And then also uh, be sure to check out our, our merch store over at store.thefluechannel.com or you can go buy our shirts, our mugs, all those types of things that we have there. A lot of this people this summer have bought in a bunch of different things, which is really, really helpful for us as well. And what else am I missing? Uh, we have a Patreon. Yeah, yeah, our Patreon, which is at the beginning of the show, which uh, you can go to patreon.com slash thefluechannel. There you can support us directly. Um via a donation every month it can be anything above two dollars you can uh do that if you want to help us out throughout the year or you can make like a one-time donation as well to there as well if you really want to help us out that way and there's the super chat thanks and there's again super chat for too. So people who people who gave us that, uh, yeah. on the super chat it's super yeah, nice of you directly as well and um and yeah. um Yeah, I yeah. think there's a couple of more questions, maybe. Or? Right. Well, we have one, but I just it's uh, it's now piling up. We'll see what we can do. We'll try to do as much as we can. Um, there's a question about wants to, oh. C foot joint or B foot joint. What's the best? Yeah, uh, Anya wants to know if you're a beginner. Where's the question mark here? Hello. Okay. Yeah. 
Ania wants to know. I'm Ania from Italy. There's a lot of people from Italy here. We're going to yeah. be there next year. So that's going to be very interesting to see a bunch of you there. Hopefully we'll see. Which foot joint do you recommend? C foot joint or B foot joint? I started playing flute in September 2020, but it's uh, it is it isn't difficult for me because I'm also a pianist. Okay, that's cool. That's cool that you're a pianist. But what would you say? You know, um, if I I would say if you change your flute, yeah. I would get a B foot joint. This way you have it. Yeah. If you have a C foot seafood joint and you're happy with your flute it's not worth changing just for that yeah That's and it tends to be more expensive if you keep your same flute and get a, a b foot with a seafood like you can interchange mm. them it tends to be very expensive to get one of those or so just be sure to mind the cost or just get uh you know when you'll change the, because yeah usually people get a flute and then if they get better and more invested in it then they get a better flute a bit later so maybe yeah. when you change it you exactly. can get the foot joint the b foot joint yeah so and i knew like there was still a lot of people in the in the 50s and 60s and 70s and even ron paul and a lot of other musicians they had c foots on their flutes because they thought one of my it projected more yeah, you know one of my teacher he has an amazing flute with a c foot joint yeah doesn't matter he plays no. sure um i had a a summer uh summer workshop with uh, Patrick Gallois. Uh -huh. He had three different ones because he felt it projected more. So if he played some Baroque music that never goes up under the low D, well, he wouldn't use... He would use like the, the one that just doesn't uh -huh. go there and then he would add if he played something more modern, uh -huh. you know, he would take the other foot joint. But like I don't have that type of budget so I just have my B foot joint. I'm happy about it. Uh -huh. Uh, then I think we have only one more question here. So, uh, what do you think? Esther wants to know what do you think about breathing, uh, flute, or piccolo? What is the difference? Like, what's the difference between breathing, via like what are the differences if there are any differences between flute and piccolo with breathing? I don't feel like breathing in is a big difference. Breathing in is breathing in, mm -hmm. but maybe in the blowing part, mm -hmm. yeah, it's smaller. So everything is like. Sometimes I feel people overblow on the piccolo. Mm -hmm. So you have a smaller aperture with your lips, so you can't put yeah, as much yeah. air. You know, you have to go yeah. with speed, like you're saying. Yeah, it's less speed, in fact, in, in a way, when you think about it, because you're making such a smaller hole, so air is having a harder time. It's being trapped there, so it's it, wherever that hole is, it's trying to escape as fast as possible already. Right, right when you close the lips, mm -hmm. the speed increases like let's say you play yeah, with a increases. water yeah, that's what a I mean. water hose yeah. and you have you cover the hole you with have the, you cover the hole mm -hmm. the speed increases and it goes further yeah. so yeah yeah so you think so think less air, think less breathing like you were saying yeah people tend to overblow on the piccolo so they think there's airiness or they think there's there's the controls a lot because they think harder. oh it's so difficult i have to you have to support yeah but support is not just pushing out air yeah the more i the older i get the more I realize support is also keeping air in. It's about blowing at the pace that you decided. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's like when I breathe in, my ribs kind of get a little bit away from each other. Mm -hmm. And then when I breathe out, I don't let it collapse all at once like, <sighs> like that. That's mm -hmm. not support. I blew a lot of air out just now. Right. But exactly. that was not supported air. That was just <sighs> a lot of yeah. air coming out. You want to... <sighs> Open, keep it open, mm -hmm. and then yeah, go at the exactly. pace that you decide, not faster exactly. than that. And you keep yeah. air. Yeah, it's yeah. about keeping air as, as much yeah. as blowing yeah. it. I knew some piccolo players, and like when they played in master class and stuff, it did not sound like he. They always had they always had too much air left over all the time because and when they're used to the flute and like the flute, like they're just like. When you when they took the head joint off of the thing, like somebody would pull the head joint away from them, the air didn't sound intense. It sounded like a little tiny thing going in, like a little tiny thing hitting the flute and doing more than what would be like when you have the flute without. When you were playing the flute, you would have whoo, like a big loud sound. Sorry if I'm blowing into the microphone, but you get that type of sound. There is a, a big audible difference, and like you said, feeling difference too. Less is more with the piccolo. I always say. A lot of support. A lot of. Like, m I feel like I'm really using my muscles, but not to necessarily blow hard, just to f make sure that I control the speed. Yeah, it's more about airstream consistency. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people, like Cortese, he was just saying here, the word support is misleading. 
it sounds like tensing your abs before you lift a heavy box and it's so not that no it's not that at all no 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 not at all it's really it's about true that there's a lot of words that we use that yeah. are misleading like exactly support i agree is one of them yeah maybe we should use um i don't know like i just think airstream air speed. Air speed. maybe airspeed is better yeah than air support speed. yeah and also like another thing that i find misleading is is when we say flexibility to Talk about being able to go from one mm -hmm. register to the other. Right. Then people think, oh, I have to move my lips a lot because it's flexibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Now I started saying stability in big intervals. In big intervals, yeah. Makes sense. Stability in big yeah. intervals. Because stability is way more efficient than a lot yeah. of movement. Because yeah. lips are not reliable. No, they're not. Lips they're, are not there's reliable. There's thousands and thousands of strands on each lip. It's and it, they're all working you yeah. know together and also not together because so if you have yeah. a choice between using your lips to get a result or using airspeed choose airspeed totally <laughs> yeah choose airspeed because you 100%. won't lips shake when you're nervous yeah. lips do all types of things you can't really rely on yeah, them yeah exactly just make keep them stable and use airspeed yeah well these have been all great questions we'll finish with one final one so Please, if you have any other additional questions that we missed your question, please leave them in the comments in the under uh, under the video. We try to get to those as well in the next video, or, or we make a video about it, you know, in the next uh, month or so. We try to do that as well. Francisco Maffiazzoli, a lot of Italian names I here. It. I love it. It's amazing. We have we um, want to go to Italy next yeah, summer. Exactly. Maybe we do a little uh, meetup or meet up something. Meetup or, yeah, meetup or a little mini masterclass in one of those places. Wants to know about changing flute. I've recently buy, bought a new open hole flute and I'm now trying to get used to it. Do you have any tips on how I can switch from closed hole to open hole the best way? Yeah, use uh, one biggest thing is use um, uh, the plugs. Uh, plugs. Yeah, there are metal ones that have metal covers, so it feels like you're actually still in a plateau key. There's also plastic ones. They both do exactly the same thing. Plastic ones are a little bit easier to take out. Fill them up. Remove one at a time every week. And when you remove, and remove uh, from the fingers closer to the thumb yeah. first and then yeah. go out. Yeah. Because, yeah, so yes, remove exactly. index first and then middle finger. Right. And then at the end, you remove the yeah. ring finger. And even some people yeah. keep the ring finger yeah. plugged. Yeah, some people keep the ring finger plugged. I keep my whole left hand plugged now. Like, my whole left hand is completely all plugged, like, with silver uh, plugs on them. I knew a lot of players that have different things because the flute is not ergonomic to everybody. It's barely ergonomic you know the change the offset g and all those things have been short attempts to a problem that's happening to almost everybody because the flute is really non-ergonomical doesn't weigh evenly throughout the whole instrument i like clarinet and stuff like that where there's a bit more evenness on how it's weight they distribution have they have a thumb rest they have yeah. rest like i'm a big encourager of adding things a, a strap strap so, so there's a lot of there's a lot of things with that with the flute. The flute is not built that way. So you really can don't feel like if you have a plug somewhere, if you have a, a thumb rest or thumb port or any additional things to help you keep it ergonomic and and easy for you to play, that's good. Sometimes don't let people anybody feel like you. they're cheating, and, and I find no it so funny. There's no cheating. No, it's about the result and yeah. not hurting and your yourself. Help. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. no cheating. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to dive a bit more into ergonomics this year as well, too. I know I've been talking to the guy from the Netherlands who makes ergonomic swan uh, goose-like head joints oh, yeah, and stuff like that, which is incredible, that. which makes it way more, you know, the flute comes to you, you not go to the flute type of thing and makes things a bit more distributed evenly. So, yeah, I always remember in the master classes during the festival, we talked about Rockstro and how the flute rocks back and stuff. And Alexa has a flute that is completely ergonomic to her she's completely changed everything there's additional keys there's there's even uh plates like she's a very tall woman but she has for even for her hands she has little key extensions and stuff like that for her hand and stuff so it really does make a difference and it's uh you have more effortless playing and that's what you want you don't want to have tension you want to have big medical problems so yeah. don't feel uh, that you're trying to do like anybody else, like everybody else just do what you do you know what feels good for you yeah, and it like it's not about suffering or there's no cheating no, at all. Zero. You so sound good. You sound good. That's exactly, all. And exactly. you're comfortable. That's all that matters. Yeah. So I hope your I hope your journey on trying to figure out how the flute works for you and stuff is a good journey. So 
Yeah, amazing, everybody. We've had almost 600 people watch this time. We've had some super chats. That's amazing. Be sure to check the link in the description for Tom Play. It's until September 13th. You can get 30% off their annual subscription. Their annual subscription is amazing because you can actually access the whole library, not just flute, but all the instruments. And uh, it's pretty nifty in that regard. Um, it's worth the price in spades, especially if you're, uh, you can't find an accompanist or you can't work with an accompanist as much as you can. This is a great alternative to kind of understand what's going on. You can do it at different speeds. You can even do different sections and all those things like that. So we will see you next time on the last Sunday of every month for the podcast. And that will be uh, next in September. So thanks, everybody, yes. so much. Um, again, like the video if you liked it. Also, leave a comment if you have a comment or question uh, that we can tackle for next month. Or if you have a good topic idea please uh we're always open to good topic ideas about that and i think there's a lot of uh great questions here thanks so much yeah, yeah. thank you for watching see you everybody take care bye